high schools or local authorities. None of them. None at all. None at all. No. Yeah, I find myself in the rare position of agreeing with Councillor Franks. The uh, high schools, I work in one. Um, the, every single one, it's obviously is part of a Middlesex Trust. So they all were out the, outside the remit of uh, us as a local authority um, in terms of, uh, you know, addressing attendance. Um, but one thing I have noticed, there is a, a recent trend of parents fighting with schools with uh, about taking them out on holidays that's crept in a lot more in secondaries in fact uh, there is evidence showing that uh, parents are encouraged to take the kids out on holiday because they'll save a lot of money and they factor in the fines that the local authority so even the fines are not a deterrent because they'll say oh put yourself together a package and factor in the 120 quid the local authority will charge you um so there is a you know culture amongst parents that we need to address as a local authority through positive encouragement, uh, not a punitive one. Um, but yeah, we are, you know, it is a bit of a struggle, um, but it's more to do with the culture uh, amongst parents when it comes to secondary attendance. Um, schools are now having to, you know, spend more money on attendance offices. So there's a further drain on their limited finances. So I think this is something that we can, in as much as we can, try and work with the academies, but they are a law to themselves and they're like the one I work for, their head office is in Slough. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's, it is a struggle. OK, um, at that point, I think we'll move on then to our next report, which is. Item eight. Uh, the CPC. I, item eight which is the Corporate Peer Challenge. And who is presenting that for us? Wow, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and what I would say from the outset is um, I won't speak for too long, hopefully. I uh, appreciate it's a packed agenda and also appreciate and recognise that lots of members have been involved in the Corporate Peer Challenge already. So I don't think there's too much need to rehash old ground. Um, but just a short introduction, if I may. Um, I should say my name. I'm Adam Diffney. I'm the Service Director for Citizen Engagement and Legal Services. I also have my colleague Jane. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly as well? Hello, Jane Malcolm, Head of Strategy and Policy for 2040. Thanks, Jane. Um, so um, members are aware of this item, as I mentioned, um, and it's really about continuous improvement. The LGA come in to see the council every five years to do a corporate peer challenge. And we had ours um, back in March this year, as I mentioned, many members involved in that. And it's about um, the LGA bringing their peers into the council to give us a bit of a health check to work out where we are, where we can develop, where we can improve and where the opportunities might be as well. Um, so our chief exec, Robin, um, asked for something slightly different this time round. He asked for a corporate peer challenge that covered off our sort of wider system position as well. So working with our partners, how we're delivering on our 2040 vision, as you'd expect. And it was a huge undertaking. Um, over the four days, we had over 250 people involved, officers, partners, members, and so on, and over 60 meetings. So really big piece of work for us. And the product of that um, was an independent review, um, an independent report, I should say, provided by the peers themselves, um, which is what we're looking at today and the product of how we're going to address that. So. So in that independent feedback report, um, we had recommendations on 10 areas, which I'll list really quickly. Um, our executive decision making, our councillor development, um, our uh, 2040 roadmap, our 2040 pledges, affordable housing delivery plan, financial management, transformation capacity, people strategy delivery, improved town centre safety and economic growth strategy. Um, and our response to that, um, and as, as is requested by the LGA, is to produce an action plan. And that's the item we're asking uh, for feedback tonight at OSB. Um, now, I think it's fair to say that plan will change over time and evolve. So this is a first iteration of that plan, following feedback this evening, executive feedback. And, you know, as plans do, it will change over time. So it is an initial version. 
just to note um, that we this mock the actual challenge and the, the sort of review hasn't finished yet. So we have the um, LJ peers back in January. Uh, it says date to be confirmed in the report, but it is actually the 22nd of January 2025. And following that, they produce a final report that we publish on in March 2025. So I should have mentioned that um, this um, uh, this plan and the final report in terms of uh, the action plan will go back to executive, um, I think, on the 22nd of July, if I recall. So lots of officers in the room today re reflecting the fact this is a corporate um, response. So it won't just be answers coming from us, but we're happy to take questions um, that members might want to pose. Thank you. Who wants to start off? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Adam. Obviously, lost in the report, positive, but also we know the challenge that uh, we face. Uh, the biggest challenge is poverty and everything is linked into it. Um, and one of the biggest criticisms within the LGA review was that 2040 is a long time away. And are we really clear about that journey? And do we have those really clear milestones with timeframes, those projects that need to, to, to come to fruition and is everyone from top to bottom aligned with it? That is the biggest question. And how would you address that within your action plans? That would be interesting to see because ultimately it's about delivery. All, you know, I've been part of this. There are lots of nice glossaries, but unfortunately, practically, impactful actions haven't really happened yet, which is going to impact our town and take people out of poverty. And it, it, it then touches all those other strands. And for me, that would be probably the biggest challenge. And that's where I would need to get that clarity. Now, that's, I think that's a really important question and something, as, as you'd expect with a big strategy like this, it's complex and complicated over a long period of time. I would just um, pick you up on one slight point before I hand over to Jane around um, impact. You know, what would, is clearly reflected in the CPC outcome is um, a positive, there's lots of positives. You know, you look at uh, 2040, how we're delivering as a system. I think if you read the report, it speaks for itself. And I, I, I know you'll appreciate that. So, so in terms of impact so far, I think what the report demonstrates is there's been a huge amount of impact. But on the specific question that you're posing, I'll, I'll hand over to Jane because you're leading on that piece of work. Yeah, and I think it's a really, really important point. And um, I've really enjoyed leading on this piece of work that I think will address exactly the point that you're making. So just to give a bit of detail about what we've been doing, um, we've spent a long time with system partners and with council leaders looking at what are the key needs that we have to address in order to reach our vision for Luton to be a place where everyone can thrive. Um, and we've got 40 needs. They form a lovely wheel and you can see them on our 2040 website and we will be um, sort of sharing those more widely. They were part of um, the progress report that we brought to you. So you've all seen them at OSB. The next stage is then to pop, plot measures against those outcomes. And we've got them in draft form um, and hopefully you'll be seeing them uh, soon. Once we've got those measures, it's about targets. We're working with, base, uh, with BI to baseline those targets um, so that we can set really um, you know, viable targets within 16 years. Then we need to go back and chunk that into milestones. So what will we achieve in the next year, three years, seven years, uh, until we've got to 2040? And that will help us plot a roadmap that sort of demonstrates the milestones that we will reach over those time periods. So there is a lot of work going on to address exactly that point. And I think within the next sort of six to nine months, we'll have a much, much clearer idea of how we're going to get to 2040 and a really clear mechanism of how we're measuring progress. Uh, Chair, so what I uh, also meant was when we're looking at roadmap, for example, you've got some of the poorest wards in the country, whether it's Dallow or Biscuit. So how many families or how many people do you identify that you will be lifting out of poverty and how will you track them and by when are we going to see the difference so by when are we going to see those people coming 
out of those wards are becoming homeless or for those people who are not getting to jobs. You know, these are the details. Unless we get that, you're not going to. So family hubs, for example, a project, something which I brought into the town, it's not quite working. So those were designed for each neighborhood to work with that population. So you start working with those families now. We haven't even begun. It's been two years. So that's the fear I, I see is that amongst, you know, all this so big blue sky thinking, we need to have that real sort of data and, and also practical steps that you need to put in place, whether it's two years, three years or five years. Thank you. Absolutely agree. And that's what the roadmap will give us. And just on the point in terms of poverty, um, I'm sure you'll be aware from our minimum income standard work that 7,200 families live in destitution in Luton, which is simply unacceptable. Um, and we have got a task and finish group that's exploring what are those main drivers to poverty and how can we put some interventions in fast that are going to drive down that poverty level as quickly as possible. And I really do think that we can end destitution in Luton I would possibly even say sooner than 2040 if we're really, really smart with how we use our resources. And there will be some more work coming forward on that that we'd like to bring you uh, when we're ready. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, I have a few, a few issues actually that have come out when I when I read the report. <coughs> um, <coughs> Firstly, when um, we were looking at the, um, if I can find it, yeah, sorry, um, there was something that uh, that showed that there was a an increasing satisfaction um, with the local population. So, um, on page 124, it said that um, the uh, that the satisfaction as a place to live. Um, had moved from, uh, no, let me get that right, sorry. Yeah, it said that 53% consider themselves to uh, to be happy, happy in living in Luton. But I wonder how that stacks up when we see that um, that the satisfaction with Luton as a place to, to live has dropped from 73% down to 59%. And that only 40% compared to previously 70% uh, of the population feel positive about the future of the town. So how does that stack up with uh, an increasing number of uh, the population saying that they feel happy? Because I don't think I don't see those two relating together with those particular figures. That's the first thing. Secondly, one of the key issues that came up um, from the in the peer review was silo working. And could I say that I I think that we as councillors, and sometimes um, we feel as councillors that we're being left out of the picture. So the silo isn't just within one group of officers and another group of officers, but it's also the fact that as, as councillors, we feel sometimes we're being left out of the picture. And I think that has come up from a lot of my colleagues across all parties. Um, that this is happening. You know, I can I can give pure examples of that, but let me give one example of that uh, about the big weekend. It was embargoed. We weren't given information about it. We had to fight for information about it. Even the ward councillors, such as Councillor Isles and myself and the Farley councillors, had to fight to get information. Now that is not right in today's in today's society. Um, I'll give you another example, and that is when we are on the step up to Luton, which is coming to. How come that? Uh, how come that uh, councillors weren't invited to the investment meeting that took place? So uh, I can know, I can name lots of these kind of issues. So the silo issue is important. It's important not just between one group of officers and another, and people doing thinking that their own area of work is important. But the fact is that that some officers forget that. Councillors have been elected by the population to run the council. OK, it's the executive, but also that each councillor is part of that process. 
And, it, and many councillors I've spoken to in the Labour Party, a few amongst the Conservative group, but especially amongst Liberal Democrats, feel that we're being left out a lot of the time and it's unacceptable. And there needs to be a further review at the highest level to ensure that going forward in the future, that there's a far greater involvement at an earlier stage by councillors. And it wouldn't have to be when we come to this scrutiny board that we're starting to, th to look at things that have already been set and established before we had any opportunity to make an input into it. Can now, I my third point, don't, let me run through it so, I don't, so that you've got them all in hand. I think the other issues that, that really spring to mind, uh, when we have a major problem, especially when we're talking about trying to lift the families that, uh, uh, that have been mentioned out of poverty, when we look at it, other items that have been picked up, so that not only has the homeless figures doubled 450 to 500 a month, total expenditure per head of population of £165.92 is well above the mean of 260 spot 987. Um, and it shows that, that Luton is in the second lowest in a group of 15 benchmark uh, authorities. Um, and again, we're the lowest in the benchmark group for total revenue expenditure on children's services per head of the population. It's 958.12 um, pounds compared to the mean of 1,228 pounds 28. And that also that, that Luton has the second lowest spend compared to need in, need in the country with 278 pounds less spending per person than is needed. So, I think when we're trying to lift um, families out of poverty, we also have a, we have a major issue about we do not have the funds and we're not even spending at the level that we need to spend going forward. So how are we going to get this extra money? We know we're not going to come from central government, even if the Labour Party can't get in. So what are we going to try and do to, 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 to try and bring us up to at least the mean average that's being, that's being spent by our bench group? I mean, this is, I mean, I've talked about crisis. You know, we talk about crisis in homelessness, crisis in, um, in not building enough homes, crisis in the fact that we do not spend the amount of money that's needed to actually to overcome the problems that we're facing. I'll stop there, Chair. Yeah, can, can I try and um, take some of that apart because you covered lots of different areas. Um, and we can't just answer it as one. Um, so let me let me just pick up the one point you made, which is councillors feeling that they're left in a silo and ignored. Um, and I bring it specifically back to your action plan, which is what this was supposed to be focusing on. Um, and under the action plan on page one four zero. CPC2 is talking about the current member development programme so that the executive team can effectively fulfil their responsibilities and need on culture change. What's that? You want me to take that one first, Chair, just to be clear. So I'll, I'll try and start with that one if that's helpful. So CPC2. Um, it talks about, and I'll just read it out just to be completely clear, to enhance the current member development programme so the executive team can effectively fulfil their responsibilities and lead on culture change. Now, there is some narrative in the report about that, um, but as you and as the CPC and the peers recognised, as with most teams that are leading an organisation in strategic sense, there can be development and improvement. I think that would be the best summary. Um, you can see there's some actions that sit alongside it. Um, so let's talk about what's what the leader and has talked to myself and Robin as the officers who mainly um, lead on the item. Um, so we've talked about mentors for the newly portfolio, newly uh, elected portfolio holders. Um, we've talked about um, the uh, exec team um, having some team building time, some time out of the council away working with other authorities. Um, Wolf and Forest is mentioned there. We're also doing a trip to Wigan. Um, it's about the relationship between the executive and uh, the top tier in the council, so CLT, um, and how they work together and can be most effective. 
Um, and it's about the member um, development charter plus re-accreditation as well, which members, some members here will be familiar with. And we're actually going for our assessment next week, which is the highest possible accreditation you can get for your member development, which is by the LGA. So, but as I mentioned, like like any team, any any team that's all like leading a, seat, a, a big organisation, there's always development, and and the peers um, have really picked up on that. So I think the response is there. There's probably not a great deal more to say. That group of activities will expand over time. But the wider question, if I may, around member engagement and involvement, um, I think first of all, sorry you feel that way. You know that's not that's not good. <laughs> No, appreciate that, but I've just responded to your question and your your feedback. So, um, my experience as an officer, from from an officer perspective, is that um, as a council now we're in the more collaborative space than we have been since I joined 15 years ago. So I think there's the boundaries and size being broken down at an officer level, and that's being led by Robin and his top team as well. So I think we're in a really positive place there. So if there's work to do with members, I'm really keen to explore that, how we can improve. And I think as you've done, Chair, and suggested um, with other items, you know, be really keen to get members around the table, the ones that are feeling uh, disengaged, um, to talk about how we can improve things. So that's the best way we can improve things, isn't it, really? So let's talk and let's try and move things forward. So if I can move on just to the other items, because I appreciate there'll be other questions. On the perception survey, there's a group of questions that are asked to residents annually. Um, trends move up and down, as you'd expect over time. The answers can depend on a variety of factors when uh, respondents actually, um, or when uh, we get responses to the survey. Um, we'll be doing it again this year. So uh, then it does uh, I get your point around happiness and then satisfaction and the correlation there it does seem a bit odd. But I think it's something it's difficult to explore in isolation, perhaps without seeing the wider picture over the three or four years we've been doing it to look at it in a bit more detail. Well, th yeah, just to just to take that point as well. So the um, perception survey, we're just looking at um, uh, launching this year's version shortly. So we'll be talking to members on that basis. So officers agreed a set of questions several years back and they we've, we've tried not to tinker with those because obviously it disrupts the trend analysis you can do year on year. But we're starting to build a bit of a background there. So but perhaps we could when we're talking to members more broadly about that disengagement piece, we can talk about the perception survey as well. So. And on the final point, <coughs> which is around um, essentially funding, I think, and how we're maximising funding into the town, I think Jane was going to talk a little bit on that item for me. Yeah, in terms of that £278 less than we need per person, it is a really stark figure. Um, and we, if you look at the map of where we are in the in our locality, we're surrounded by areas who have more than um, their need per head. Uh, so the inequality in where we exist is really stark. And really, our only solution to that is lobbying the powers that be and a public affairs policy uh, for the council that really tackles the inequality of how funding is given out to local authorities. Uh, we have got a plan uh, coming forward that's going to be um, discussed at an officer level over the next few weeks. Um, and we're hoping that with the support of colleagues such as yourself, we can start to make more of a noise about that on the national scale that will help um, sort of change how funding is um, is given out across the country to benefit Luton. I suggest then that perhaps not just the officers discussing that, but, but to get the engagement of councillors at that early stage and to see what can be done. Because otherwise we'd be in the same situation, go through it again, you're presenting something to us where we could have perhaps made an impact from the beginning. Mine's actually a comment, Chair. Do you want to hold that until after questions? Or Okay, um, I'm, I'm looking at... Paragraph 2.1 on page 116, which refers to a recommendation from the peer panel that the council should set up a process of executive members regularly meeting with senior managers, corporate directors, etc. We had precisely that when the council was run by the Liberal Democrats. 
we called it the joint board. It met monthly uh, with an occasional additional meeting when it was felt necessary. It led directly to the council being able to raise funding for three very important projects, which it otherwise wouldn't have done. One was the dual carriageway all the way from the M1 to the airport. The second one was a million pound refurbishment of Wardown Park. And the third one was funding for the establishment of the Stockwood Park Discovery Centre, all of which are major assets for the council, all of which were funded as a result of experimental correspondence, if you like, at meetings, informal meetings, at which, of course, no decisions could be made between senior managers and executive members. When the Labour Party took over the council in 2007, they continued this arrangement and they continued it for quite some time. They then decided to abandon it. I've got my own theories as to why they abandoned it, but I'm going to bore you with those. But the fact is, uh, it's now recommended that it should be reinstated. And I wholeheartedly hope that the council will, in fact, the Labour group will, in fact, decide to reinstate those regular meetings between executive members and uh, senior managers. They can be extremely fruitful. They Clearly, there's uh, a need to ensure that they don't actually get anywhere near making decisions, which must be made uh, through the formal process. But the informal conversations and debates can be extremely useful. But first of all, Kamad, in, in, in terms of, I think one of the things that LGA peer group had recognised is the, despite all the cuts that was in the funding, the there's still this council has made major improvement and made have managed to continue the services because remembering we nearly lost you know in terms of funding nearly 170 million pounds which is a huge sum and that really needs to be kept kept into mind but in 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 terms of you know secret meetings and that if members don't find the time like big weekend example my our colleagues Councillor Stephen made uh, if we attend the meeting all the information was given Farley councillors those of us that attended that those that couldn't attend were given the information and asked for it and we did there was some information that uh, the BBC was not prepared to uh, confidential they didn't want to release uh, and that was the only one. So, you know, we're not kept into t completely in the dark. At least I wasn't, and neither was my two other colleagues. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, that sort of, uh, and I think the another South Ward council sitting there was also attending the meeting, every one of them. So we, we were, in, in terms of that, we were in full. But one of the things that I, you know, we're talking about the giant board, we're talking about the information, can, can, I, can I just suggest that in the LGA action plans, uh, is there a time scale in some of the things that you said they're coming back, right? And there's a huge exper experience among the whole of the uh, peer review group. Uh, are they likely to, to, to come back and have a look at where did we go sometime in the future? I mean, something that they used to do in, in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, I'm not sure if you picked up, Councillor, but they're basically um, the LGA come back um, in January 2025. And that's the, the formal second part of the review when they test what we've done, what progress we've made and then do a final report thereafter. That's the set process that the LGA have in place. So all the checks and balances are in place and we, we can't affect that. That's their own process. So so obviously there's a there's a, a point now between the next six or so months where we've got some uh, real time to make some positive progress progress and they'll test us on that and they are challenging as anyone involved with the review will um testify they they are they push us quite hard they challenge us hard but i'm glad um you've um, uh, also recognized the real positive nature of the report because i didn't i didn't introduce it the right way that should have been the point i started on councillor because largely the review was extremely positive for the town, despite the funding issues we have, despite all the challenges we have. You know, we're still doing a really positive job for the residents of Luton as a collective. 
Yeah. Can I just add, in terms of member development, those of us that, uh, you know, part of that uh, member development, I mean, all members were asked to, to get, get, you know, fill the form, a development form, and I hope every member in this room as well have, have returned that, and then they, they will be, in terms of the training, in terms of the skills and all that, will be done in the future. But it is for you to cooperate what your needs are too. So it is something the members need to take it seriously rather than passing the buck. So it's, it's for all of us, what do we need most? What do we need in member development thing? And for us to be able to tell the and, and, and the, your team to, to what the training program we need to do. So I think that was really for us to take some responsibility, not always passing the buck to the officers. I'd like to just slightly change tack. Um, there are some parts of the peer review which are making a number of statements. Um, are you confident that the action plan that you've given me um, in, in the document, and mostly it doesn't conform, I have to say, to what I call a plan because it doesn't have any due dates on it. So to my mind, an action plan that doesn't have due dates isn't an action plan. Um, so mm. if, if I start from there, um, and then there are a number of areas within the peer review. Um, and if I just pick up a couple of examples for you. Um, and yes, it, it is true that um, we as a council have, have been able to have a balanced budget. Um, but the, re the peer review says without the use of reserves, I don't believe that's the case. Um, and the transformation capacity, um, which talks about um, deficit recovery, I don't see much evidence of deficit recovery being made. Um, so there are a number of areas, um, quality of impact of supervision and management oversight, stability of workforce, the quality and analysis of assessments of children, there are things within the report. Are you satisfied that the action plan as we have it has addressed each one of those um, critical elements in the peer review? And where are the dates that actually say what will happen when? So, um, uh, no, point, point taking, Councillor. And I think, first of all, I think it's fair to say, you know, the peers have set the, town, the council, our partners, a huge challenge. You know, they've picked up on some of the challenges that we knew existed already, housing and, and so on. So, you know, this isn't going to be an easy ride. There is a time scale column in the plan what talks about some of the time scales that we're working to initially. If that isn't suitable, and um, we can take that back as a bit of feedback from this evening and try and sharpen that up before that goes to executive in a bit more detail. So um, it's just after the action owner. So, so there's several comments in, in each one. So we'll say, like CPC um, 6, for example, says the time scale is by October 2024. So, but we can look to um, make that slightly clearer if that's at all possible. Um, Personally, I think um, the confidence factor will depend on which of the areas. I'm sure some of them are easier wins, if that's the right phrase to use, than others. So, and what I do know is the officers involved will give it their best efforts to try and get us as far as we can. So, but as I said at the start of the uh, introduction, um, this will change. This is a first version. We're ahead of the game. You know, we have had this plan um, evolving over the last six weeks or so. I think Robin had almost written it the day after um, the peers had left. So as you can imagine, was keen to get something down straight away. We've got the, the what we perceive as the right governance in place to track and monitor. Um, the chief exec is owning it himself with the action owners is on the sheet there. So I don't know, Dev is with me here, just he wants to pick up on some of the particular points around transformation, finance, def, uh, deficit recovery and so on. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think in terms of the point you've made about reserves, uh, it's correct. We haven't used reserves, but uh, you've been sitting in part of the FRG. Yeah, we have used contingency, which is part of the budget. So probably you're referring to the use of 
the general contingency, but we haven't used the reserves. Uh, when we were hit by COVID, that's, we know we went for an emergency budget. So the council put a program of 22 million of savings and that savings has helped us to have a sort of balanced budget. Uh, and we have not used reserves. So the this year's outturn will come out. So we'll be discussing that uh, at FOG next week. Uh, but coming back to your point, is it a challenge to have a balanced budget? Absolutely. And you know the context where a lot of councils are in difficult position because coming back to the point uh, members made is the the funding is not. Yeah, and that's government has been uh, planning to do what you call the fair funding review. So that at least balance the, the, the way the local government is funded. And if you look at the challenges faced by the council is similar to a London borough but the funding is not similar to the London Borough. So hopefully sooner or later, uh, the government will come up with, whoever government is in power, come up with a fair funding settlement. And that helps the council to plan as well going forward, rather than last minute in December, we'll get, there's another one of funding, and then we just balance the budget. Coming back to the deficit recovery plan, it has been a challenge. and the major events, like uh, we had a, a sort of a plan to, to balance our budget, but then we were hit by COVID. But even after that, we brought a lot of savings in order to have a balanced budget. So we were quite quite successful as a council with support of members and, and, and officers and residents. Uh, lately, the challenge has been the inflation, cost of living and interest. So the demand in terms of homelessness has gone up significantly the gap in the homelessness budget, as Council Khan mentioned, because of the cost of living crisis, because of the interest uh, rate, which has been high, because of inflation, we are seeing more demand and we are seeing more people being become homeless. So we as a council has got the statutory responsibility to house those, those people, and that is putting a pressure in the budget. Uh, and and hopefully if we start to come out, if the economy start to pick up and start to grow, if interest rate come down, inflation stabilizes, then we might start to be more hopeful in delivering the deficit recovery plan. Because the challenge when in one hand you're trying to control your costs and deliver a deficit recovery plan, then on the other hand, the demand and cost is going up because inflation was around 10%. So that in itself put a lot of pressure on all sort of, sort of uh, uh, department, including IT costs, in, in social care costs and everything. So it's ha it has, was it had been easy? No, it had been a real challenge. We're already talking about 25, 26 budget already. We just approved February and now we are in June. We already had the first meeting and talking about 25, 26 budget. Uh, is it going to be getting easier? I don't think so. The challenge and we're still here. Uh, it's just like officers, you have to work how we can make best use of our limited resources. And that's not going to be easy. It's, it's a teamwork, it's a system work across partners, across systems, working with residents, working with officers, finding how we can stretch our limited time. Uh, uh, and that's so we'll be discussing about the uh, this year's outturn in FRG. So I'm sure Councillor Frank will be chairing that meeting. So we'll have quite a discussion about where we end up in these years. So just to end up, it, it, it is a challenge. It's, and I don't think it'll be getting any easier any sooner. Um, I'm feeling a bit conflicted now because you've got what you said, Jane, that we can, if we be clever with our resources, we can pull these families out of poverty and we can make sure that that is above the threshold. After hearing you, Dev, I'm feeling a little bit deflated as if there's a possibility that that may not happen. So what is it? Is it yes, we can or no, we can't? Or is there going to be a contingency plan? Because what I'm from what I'm hearing, there needs to be a contingency plan. So, yes, there's got to be dates, like you've said, Chair, um, in terms of the action plan itself. But I do feel like there's going to have to be a backup plan because there's slightly conflicting ideas of what this is actually looking like. I think the two, two elements is the long term and the short term. I think what Jane was saying, our plan is 2040 and 
There's significant investment going into town regeneration. There's significant investment we're discussing with the airport, and the airport brings a significant amount of, of income. So investment in the airport, working with the airport, and the airport will create employment. So employment is the way education, our schools are quite treated. So investment in the education is good working in partners. The point which I was making here is a bit the short term. So local government, we plan three, four years. That's we have to make sure we invest and we are doing already the stages under the project, which is regeneration. So the long term, yes, that's the aim of the council to start to look at the long term. And that's what we're not just looking. But what I'm saying, will it get easier in the next couple of years when inflation has to stabilize, interest rate will have to come down. And when I say it, will it get easier? It's not just for the council. I'm saying is with everybody in the UK as well. OK, uh, people will have to get, get in the uh, property ladder and at the stage we're building homes as well. So that's a big project. So when I say short term, will it get a bit easier in the next couple of years? Probably not, because this economy has to be stabilized. Economy will have to grow and employment will have to come down. Inflation will have to come down. Interest rate will have to come down. So those are the macroeconomic factors and other things, the geopolitical factors as well. So when you look at national level, that has an impact. Uh, and those are factors I'm saying is not just the council is doing everything which we can, and we're investing quite a lot, uh, but those macroeconomic factors and geopolitical factors, all the things which are happening across the world, that has a big impact on UK economy and, and, and local, local area as well. So that that's maybe is how we reconcile both the short term, long term, if that's going to be a challenge. And Chair, if I may add, may I add, um, just in terms of where is the the power to achieve a real um, amazing ambition across Luton? Um, it's not just in the council and the resources we have. It very much is a system wide vision, and it's about our communities, our neighbours on on our streets, and how are we galvanizing what we have within our community to really all together uh, try and end destitution. And I don't really think we've properly even started to tap um, the potential there. Um, but there's a lot of work coming forward, particularly through what Marek's going to be doing around um, sort of community leadership of members and how we can work more with you to really unlock the potential in your communities to do that. Um, so I do think, it, yes, the council has a big role to play as the place leader and our resources are key within that. But there is there is power within our community that I think we can really harness in a way we haven't yet. Can I, can I come back on the issue? It's both short term and long term with regard to trying to deal with the homeless problem. So. I still don't understand, even if we can find the land space within the town, do we have the money to actually build? Are we able to borrow? What, what, what are we able to do? How, how can we get out of this demise? Because we're adding to, it's not as if we're at, at a stable situation, because each month, 450 to 500 people are being added to the homeless numbers. You know, so without even trying to address the current situation that we have, it's building up. And across the year, you, you, well, you can do the calculation across the year, what we're going to add to that. So how are we going to, I don't understand, even with the plan, how we're going to try to get out of that problem. Uh, where is the money going to come from? You know, we can't, if, you know, I say even if it's a change of government, we're not going to suddenly get big funds going to the councils. It's not going to happen. Are we able to borrow? Are we able? To, are we financially in a situation where we could borrow to build, for example? So in terms of the housing, it's a national problem. So, But we have yeah. to deal with Luton. Yeah. Forget, yeah. The, forget so, the national problem. Yeah. We have to deal so with Luton. So in terms of Luton, when we borrow, we have to ensure that we can service that debt, because otherwise you will be putting debt on your balance sheet and which can't service. So, and service the debt, we'll have to make sure that when you're investing in a housing project, that project is viable. But what we do is when you look at the stage, 
there was a 20 million pound grant, which we received from uh, the funding. So that makes the project viable. And you will understand that in the last couple of years, the cost of build, building houses has gone up significantly. So that is proving difficult for council, housing association, and the private sector to invest and make project viable. And we are all hoping that interest rate come down, inflation come down, then we can bring a scheme which are viable. But despite the challenge, the still the project, which is a state project, is a more than 100 million pound project, and that will bring affordable home as well. So coming back to the point, when you look at more social housing, like the HRA is right to buy, there's a number of properties which we are losing. So we are replacing as many properties as we could. In fact, uh, there is an uh, interest of for HRA to buy one block in the stage. So that would be everything affordable. So the council is doing as much. So we have the temporary accommodation purchase scheme. There was TAPS 1. There was a next phase. Now we've got third phase. And we're talking about tens and tens of millions of investment in order to provide residential and properties for pe uh, uh, people who are homeless. And the next phase is we are buying sort of uh, uh, properties where we are converting into providing like supported living and ac or the accommodation where trying to move residents who are in bed and breakfast or, or, or nightly led properties because that's not good for anybody and we're trying to move them with more more properties, which is much more and controlled by the council. So we'll be owning those properties. Uh, Foxhall Home is one of the subsidiary companies which uh, we've we've created, and Foxhall Home is creating and 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 building those properties with a bigger number of affordable. Yeah, and you're you're part of that. But it has been a challenge lately, and you know the challenge we are facing in terms of the market. But the council is trying to do whatever we can. Have we got a limit to our borrowing? In theory, if you have a business case, you can borrow, but at the same time, you have to see how much borrowing you can put in your balance sheet. So we are very uh, sort of, uh, uh, we understand how much, but for housing, we we the stage the big, big uh, investment uh, which we are going to borrow because we've got the business case, we've got it viable, and we are looking at it, and we're trying to make that 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 uh, project a success. Um, but if you have to solve all our housing, you say, even there's not enough properties where the council can buy. So even if we say just go buy a lot of properties, and that's not. And if you go and buy too much properties, you will at the same time influence the market and the price will go up. So it's quite a, quite a difficult act to, yeah, but the council is committed, as I said, in terms of the stage project, Foxhall home building, additional affordable, having TAPS 1, TAPS 2, TAPS 3. Uh, but coming back to what Jane said is, at the end of the day, we, we have to be realistic and we have to, to work with everybody and community to, 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 to tackle that, that homelessness problem. But it, it, it is a challenge. I'm sure you're saying it's, it's not just for, it's for Luton to how we're going to tackle it, but it's a national, national issue is, and, 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 and we're doing our best, uh, but the demand just keeps on going up. I've yeah. just had a, a short side um, discussion here with Councillor Khan. Uh, just getting back in just a second. Yeah, I, I completely appreciate the constraints that we're working under, and it's not just us alone, it's across the country. But take your mind back when we had the first challenge. The reason we have become more sustainable because we were creative of coming out of the uh, solution. If we think that we're like a London borough, we go act like one, we go, go to behave like one, and we go to plan like one. And the solution is not just ours alone, it's partnership solution. So with that hat on, we've got to, we can bring this down, but we can build more. We can build more and the, we simply provide the infrastructure and private sector brings in the money. We've got to find a, a model that allows people to do that. And I can tell you one thing, there's probably 101 investors who come and talk to me how could we get involved in Luton market and yet we shut the doors so there are solutions i'm sorry to say that sometimes we work in a tunnel vision and i know we're not in an ideal position to borrow 
but there are people, enough people to invest money and there's creative ways of doing it. And I think collectively we need to start looking at how do we address this problem like we've done it before. We've done it once before with airport, we can do it with the housing. Amit Chair, absolutely. Uh, we are going to look at whatever innovative solution. The one I've mentioned is the point you mentioned, Councillor Khani's uh, private sector can do it. And we've done something with a Foxhall home like a private sector. So rather than giving our land, remember four or five years ago, sometimes housing association, council will provide the land to make those projects viable. But we're saying Foxhall home is a separate legal entity operating as a private sector. And we are selling land, we're not giving land to folks alone, selling land at market value. And that is bringing the capital receipts to the council. And folks alone is developing those land and putting more affordable housing that the private sector can provide. So it has been a win win folks alone. It's just lately the challenge because of the cost and some of the construction company are clearly facing a challenge. Coming back to your point, we, 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 in fact, uh, Myself and uh, Councillor uh, Shaw and Councillor Ross, we went to Warrington just to see what they're doing because they are quite active. So we are not, we are open to learn from other council. The point about private sector, yes, I've had several councillors, companies approaching and what normally they come up with is what we call the income strip model. So we've looked at that and it's a model which which some of the council have have involved, but the risk with the income strip model is it's linked with inflation. So let's say if we went into an income strip model about three years ago for the private sector to build, but what they say is you pay rent plus you pay a additional link with retail price index. So that's one model. So if you go into rent and you build those properties and your local housing allowance most of the time is cap, it won't go up. And suddenly your rent goes up by inflation, which is RPI. So you create a big gap. So the income strip model has got a place, but when you've got the economy which is volatile and in terms of the inflation, if it keeps on going up, it's very difficult. So it's not something, it's a preferred model. But if we are lately, I was, in fact, today I was discussing is there, there is a, 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 a financial institution we're talking about potentially probably uh, having some other type of income strip model where the council is this protected. It's not like a RPI for RPI code. So there are cap and color you can put. So we are always looking at it, but we have to base in terms of what are the risks, what is the and whether we can sustain if there is something fluctuation in interest rate and, and inflation. So we are open to look at those models. But coming back to your point, private sector, that was the reason why we built Foxhall Home. But if there's other model which we can use, we are looking at others, working with councillor show, or the like shared um, um, ownership model, that's as well we're exploring. But we will look at anything to do that. Housing is top, top of the council priority. And, and that's what um, I think the, the members made it clear as well. And is housing come a lot of things, which is if you have a stable home, that, that's much better for the family. Thank you. Okay, just... Get, let's come back again to we we discussed around the this, the topic quite quite a lot. Um, we're being asked here to um, comment as a board on the action plan going forward to the executive. Um, do we feel that the uh, that we are able as a board to? recommend the action plan as we see it in our papers for executive yes councillor bagum um can i just make a comment that we in my own opinion we accept the action plans but can we have a little bit more trans transparency and clear communication because i just feel that we don't really have there's still silos within the council where some councillors are saying we don't feel included in the processes and to some mm. degree i agree that things come through to OSB and we're not fully aware where they've come from, what they what started the process or what is the full process and where we kind of sit because we're presented with the paper, we've got to make a decision. We've heard a lot about peer reviews. Um, I've heard from other colleagues about the peer reviews, but obviously not to this sort of detail. So in a sense, we do kind of feel, well, I feel anyway, 
that we're still left in the dark. And I think there are still silos that we need to break. So although I welcome this in terms of all the action plans, and it does pick up on quite a few other things that are needing improvement, but I do think that we need that little bit more transparency and honesty between us. Chair, if Councillor Begum is moving that formally, I'm happy to second it. Same things we were talking about with the with the corporate report as well. I think exactly um, with, with the with the setting. Um, I'm happy to take that if you if you want to put that forward as as a motion to to take forward, and then Councillor Frank says he's happy to do that. Can you help with framing the words correctly to through to Eunice, please? Can I put that in writing to you then, Eunice? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Frank. You. Good suggestion. Um, in in principle, then, what we're saying as as um, OSB is yes, the 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 action plan that we see in front of us, we're happy to go forward. Um, I I think it's fair to say that we would like to see um, more detail, more precision in terms of the the dates and and who's going to do what by when. But, but in principle, yes, we're quite happy because it needs to go forward and there are lots of areas of improvement. I'm pleased to see it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, so. On to... Um, Item nine, step forward, Newton progress report, um, page one, four, five in your papers tonight. Sorry. We, we have a video, if I'm told. Is, is that OK? If we we would like to open with a short summary video clip of progress on step forward, Luton, it's if, probably more impactful than us talking to it. If you if you think that's the right way, go for it. Over to you, Eunice. Oh, Corey, oh, you are doing it. Okay. Sorry, I was I was going to say I can play, but I think it might echo. Have you got it on your machine to play Ch through the? Because I think Ch it can play the sound through both. It helps to shorten the process, please. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight. Let's see if we can. Whilst we see if we can work the technology our side. Uh, we're just worried it might echo back if if Corey plays it from here. Um, so everyone's had the report. I'm mindful of time. So did you want me to cover anything in particular or just pass straight over for for questions? How would you like to us to manage it, Councillor Wynne? Just do members wish to have the report formally presented? Or do you wish to move directly into questions concerning the report? Questions? Yep, yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to go directly into questions if that would shorten the time. Yeah. You're going to start? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, get to the business. So, um, step forward, great idea. You know, I'm a fan of marketing strategy strategy and in but measuring the impact is very important so i would like to know that after all so a year down the line after the launch what impact has it made and what's the view of our local residents are they bought into it or not and if they're not what more work needs to be done there was two elements of course one was getting people on board on the journey and with obviously uh, all the branding and everything else. And the second was, how does that change the perception of Luton? And if we, I know Big Weekend is part of it, but if we park that and just look at this as a driver um, and see, you know, how do you measure the success? We're hoping that we can show you the, because it's got those figures in it, Councillor Khan. If we can get it to work, it might answer that. Otherwise, we'll talk to it. Corey, are you in Teams? Have you joined Teams? Okay. Oh, 
I'm afraid it doesn't look as if this is getting us very far. It's just showing you the progress. What we'll do is we'll, do you want to pause it? What we'll do is we'll circulate the video so members can watch it in their own, in their own time. In terms of answering your, your key questions, in terms of the progress we've made. Some of those figures are in the report. So we've had over 65,000 visits to the place website, as well as over 5,700 followers across all our social media. And we've reached almost 1.5 million through our posts. We've also had uh, been linked into a number of events across the town. It's obviously formed a big part of Radio One Big Weekend. We got Luta Monopoly and it was part of the launch of the FA Get Into Re Refereeing programme. We've now got over 50 ambassadors which have, have, have come on board organically because they've seen Step Forward Luta and they want to be part of it. And that's growing and, and Radio One has absolutely helped with further gathering more interest into the campaign. Corey, is there any other key statistics that would be worthwhile with sharing in terms of reach? Um, no, that that's covered everything. But I think we're still, just to say, we're still seeing um, a bit of a kind of drive on those numbers on the back of the Radio One Big Weekend. 